Oh, oh, excuse me, excuse me, yes, I'm sorry, I'm, I just keep, I just keep falling asleep, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm, oh, I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm awake, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just like so many Christians nowadays, <laughs> people that claim to be Christians that just, they just seem to be asleep all the time, and, uh, they don't, they don't seem to be awake. Well, today's message is, are you awake? You see, as a Christian, and I did a message here a week or two ago about what is a Christian. When I use the word Christian, I mean people that are saved, but there's a lot of people that are lost that claim to be Christians also. But I try to always refer to those that are saved. But we live in a day and age when there's many people that claim they're Christians, and they're... They're sound asleep. So what I want to do today... I'd like to preach you a message entitled, Are You Awake? There are so many things going on in this world today, and yet so many people that claim to be Christians are sound asleep. They don't see it. They don't see what's going on. Let's start with Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you, shall give you the light. A lot of Christians today, they're asleep. They're in the dark. They're not waking up to the truths of the Bible. They're not waking up to the fact that there's a lot of things going on today that are proving Bible prophecy and they're, they're showing and pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I talk to a lot of people that claim to be Christians and it's like they don't even see what's going on around them. Many of them say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a long time, you know. With all that stuff written in the Bible, that's pretty, but that, that's not happening now. Are you, are, you, are you serious? Are you awake? Yes, there are many things happening now that point to the soon return of Jesus Christ. And there's so many things happening right now that it's hard to claim to be a Christian and not see it coming to pass. There are so many things that are coming to pass all you need to do is just open your eyes and just see what's going on around you. It proves that the Bible is true. But yet there's a lot of Christians that are asleep. Let's go and uh, look at the scriptures and I want to ask you about six or seven different points and ask you, are you awake to certain things? Now this is more than just a message to Christians. This is to lost people. If you're not even saved, I want you to see this video in the hopes that you'll ask the question, are, am I awake? Because there's a lot of people that are, that are asleep and don't see the things that I want to talk about today. And what I try to do in this message, I hope to God I can do, is open your eyes to what's really happening in this world. You know, some people say that everything you learned is wrong. Well, that's almost true. Because many things that we've learned today are not true. They are lies. And people are preaching lies in the world. And a way to not be deceived and follow those lies are to stick with the Bible. The King James 1611 authorized version. So the first thing I want to do today is, is look at the word awake. Are you awake? I looked up the word awake and I found that it appears 42 times in 32 verses in the King James Bible. So are you awake to the fact that... And I've got seven different things I want to ask you. Are you awake to? You know, you might be asleep on these things. I get a lot of emails, a lot of letters, a lot of phone calls, people talking with me, and it helps me to get an idea of what people in the world are going through and what they're seeing. And uh, I'm seeing, like I said at the beginning of this, there's a lot of people that are just sound asleep, and they're not awake to what's really going on. And the first thing I want to ask you is, are you awake to the fact that Jesus is God. Do you know that? There's been attack in these last several hundred years on the deity of Jesus Christ. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Are you awake to the fact that Jesus is God? 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15:34. Reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34, we read, Awake to righteousness and sin not. 
for some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. You know, it's a shame for a person to not know that Jesus is God. The United States of America, probably one of the greatest nations that have ever lived on the face of this earth. And around the 1800s in the United States of America, we had what was called the, the uh, Victorian Age. And Christianity was everywhere. And you would be hard-pressed to find someone that didn't know that Jesus was God. Even lost people knew that Jesus was God. Even in the 1700s in England and other places. They preached the gospel and preached the Bible that everyone knew that Jesus Christ is God. But yet in these last days there are people that go around and claim to be Christians. And they don't preach this. They don't preach that Jesus is God. Why? There's a gigantic, gigantic organization in the world today. I can't call it a church because it doesn't even call itself a church. It calls itself a society. There's a gigantic society today that goes door to door and knocking on doors and trying to, to get people to follow them with their little colorful cartoon pamphlets that they ha hand out. And they like to talk to people and tell people about their organization, uh, their, their little uh, tower organization that they, they t love to tell people about. And they claim to be followers of Jehovah. But if you talk to these people and you ask them right out, Is Jesus Christ God? They say, No, we don't believe He is. They're asleep. But if you read the Bible, you can't miss that Jesus Christ is God. It says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Without controversy. There should be no controversy. Jesus Christ is God, manifest in the flesh. But you see, there are false sects in the world today. There are heresies all over the world today. There are people that run around and say, oh, I'm a Christian. Yet they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. Go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. This should be the first thing you should wake up to. This should be the first thing that you understand. It's so important who Jesus Christ is. Matthew 1 23 tells us as we read through the scriptures, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus Christ is called Emmanuel, because Jesus Christ is God. God came down from heaven and dwelt upon this earth for 33 years, the Bible teaches. It used to be even lost people, all of society believed this and knew this, even people that weren't saved. You ask them, who is Jesus? They'd say, well, he's, he's God. But we live in the last days when many people have grown up without ever hearing the preaching of the Word of God. Many people don't believe this. Many people claim to be Christians and like to cause a controversy and say that Jesus is not God. 1 John 5.20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now we're in 1 John, let's read a couple verses, because in the last days we're told that there will be people that come and preach against this sound doctrine that Jesus Christ is God. In 1 John 2.22 we read, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that not denieth the Father and the Son. So if someone ever comes and says, Jesus isn't God, He's not the, uh, the Christ, He's not the promised seed, then they are a liar and an antichrist. 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even already now, now already it is in the world. Is in the world. Is it in the world. <laughs> Get my little words reversed there. So the Bible teaches us that there will be some spirits in these last days that come and they attack this doctrine of the deity of Christ, of Jesus Christ being God. It's not hard to find these people. Many of them are open and out and around. But ever since the late 1800s, you find these denominations popping up, and many of them all have one thing in common. Many of these denominations deny that Jesus Christ is God. 
with the influence and the, and, the, and the growth of this spiritualist movement. If you've ever studied the spiritualist movement, where the New Age came from, the New Age movement, it all tells you that Jesus Christ is not God, that you can be your own God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. 2 John 1.7 says, For many deceivers are in and entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And in these last days in which we live, we see more and more people trying to deceive and be deceived. So are you awake to the fact that there are many deceivers in the world who claim that Jesus Christ is not God? Many seducing spirits who won't walk around to try to deny this biblical fact? Are you awake to that? There's a lot of Christians that contact me and say, well, I use this version, and I use this version, and I use this version. And I say, why? There's only one Bible. It's the King James authorized version. All other versions of the Bible, I can take you to the verses and show you where they attack the deity of Jesus Christ. They were put out by people who do not believe that Jesus is God. Or that do believe it, but allow spirits to allow them to change key verses that preach that Jesus is God. And so when they do that, what are they doing? They're helping the deceivers. They're helping the Antichrist. And they're bringing in false versions of the scriptures that attack the deity of Christ. And they're there. You can find it. One of these days I'll make a video about that. Why the King James only. And show you some of these places. Now you can go online and see a video that I did do about why the King James. And uh, have that video done. Also go to YouTube and look up my uh, sermon on Who is Jesus? Talk a little bit more about how Jesus is God and give more verses and scriptures. So are you awake to that fact? That's probably the most important thing that you need to be awake to, that Jesus is indeed God. Are you awake to the fact that the law does not save us? You know, there's a lot of people out there who claim to be Christians, and yet they preach things foreign to the scriptures. The Jehovah Witnesses say Jesus is not God. There's people out there that say the law saves and you've got to do good works and keep the law if you want to get to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Many of them call themselves Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, many of them have a connection to Mary Baker Patterson Eddy and, and the Christian Scientologist woman. And, and all these, they all have a connection. If you ever go study all these different so-called denominations that rose in the late 1800s, they all kind of tie together. Jehovah Witnesses. Seventh-day Adventists, Millerites, uh, the Christian science. And there's all this root in this New Age spiritualism. And when you read their books, you find, wow, they don't believe Jesus is God. Where does that all come from? Well, we'll look at that. But first of all, the Bible teaches us that we are not saved by works. Yet today, everywhere you go, people claim to be Christians, and they say, well, man, if you, if you do wrong, just do good to make up for it. You know, you watch the news, or, or you listen to people that, that uh, aren't Christians, and they see how evil the world is getting, and it's funny what they say is, well, I guess I just need to do good, and God will accept me. That, that's the, the carnal mind of man. Well, I've done all this bad, now if I do good and make up for it, just maybe God will accept me. Well, have you ever woken up to the fact that we are no longer under the Old Testament law? Have you ever woken up to the fact that the law is over, and now it's grace by which we're saved? I mean, you can't miss this if you reach the, read the Bible, but there's a lot of people that claim to be Christians that are asleep, and they don't see it. Wake up! Look at what the Bible says about salvation. It says it's not through the law. It says it's through grace. Look at Galatians 2.16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Titus chapter 3, and verse 5. Over and over and over again, the Bible tells us that we're not saved by works, we're saved by faith in Jesus Christ and what He's done. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Not by works of righteousness, not what we do that saves us, it's what Jesus did for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Have you opened your eyes up yet? Are you still asleep? Do you see that the law 
was given to Moses for the Israelites. But then Jesus came, and then He called Paul, and gave Paul the Gospel. And Paul took that to us Gentiles, and we're saved by faith in the Gospel, not by faith in the law. Jesus Christ died. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, tell us the gospel of salvation. You know what some of the, one of the saddest things I've ever seen was? As a minister of the gospel, I've preached in about 200 churches. And one thing I like to do is every church I go to, I stand up and I say, uh, first thing I'd like to ask is who here can tell me what the gospel is? In about 200 churches, only about 10 times has anyone ever answered right. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Most of the time, people say, well, the gospel, the gospel, hmm, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> well, those are gospels because they talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But where in the Bible does it say this is the gospel? The majority of so-called Christianity today has no idea what the gospel is or where it's found in the Bible. So let's look at it, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Why, here it is. Paul is telling us what it is. Which I preached unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. So this is how we're saved. Notice what I'm about to read. He doesn't say, now if you keep the law, then God will accept you, because it's all about good works. If you get a chance, go to my sermon, The Law versus Grace, and go to another sermon that I did on YouTube, Faith versus Works. I go more into detail, because it's so sad to see people go into church that sincerely love Jesus Christ, but they're lost and they're going to hell. Because they're asleep, and they've never woken up to the fact that, oh, it's the free gift of salvation by faith in the gospel that saves. It's faith that saves us, not works. So what does it say here? It says in verse 2, If you keep in memory what I preach, preach unto you, unless you believe it in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, why did Jesus die for our sins if we can get saved by doing the law? Why did he do that? I mean, he did it for nothing if we could save ourselves by good works. Had it been for something, what was it for? Because that's what God said to place your faith in to go to heaven. And it says that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Have you woken up to that? Have you realized, hey, it's not what I do that gets me to heaven. It's what Jesus did for me. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. All what Jesus did, Him, the Son, and we trust what Jesus did, and that's what saves us. It's not trusting in what the law does. Yet there are many people that are still asleep. I've had people write me and, and send me dirty letters. I've had people make YouTube videos against me and say, Robert Breaker so evil because he keeps saying that you're not saved by works. It's not me that's saying that. It's the Bible. And if you read the Bible, you'd understand, wow, this is the greatest time in history to live because we're saved by faith alone without works. We're saved by faith alone, trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what saves us. Have you woken up yet? Have you seen that? How about this one? Are you awake? Do you know that we are in the last days? I have a lot of people that, that I've talked to over the years that say, you know, I, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life. And, you know, you say, well, what about the Bible talks about Jesus can come at any time? And what about all the things that are happening in the world that prove to Jesus is coming soon? They, oh, well, you know, that's not going to happen in my lifetime. Really? People go out, get a 40 or, or 50 year mortgage. You know, I'll pay that off before Jesus comes. Really? <laughs> no, there's a long time before Jesus comes. Really? Do you really believe that? I, I don't think so. I think if you would open your eyes, wake up, you would see that we are in the last days and we are very, very close to the coming of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 1 through 7, here's what the Apostle Paul says will happen in the last days. And I believe we are in the last days. Now when I say last days, I mean the last days of what this is, the church age. Make sure I write that up there. This is the church age. We are in the last days of the church age. Which means what's next in God's timeline is the rapture of the church. And we are about right here. We are very close to the coming of Jesus Christ. And look what it says 
Paul is speaking about the last days in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Sound like today? It does to me. Traitors. Oh, we see a lot of those in the world today. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They don't want to believe that Jesus is God. They don't want to do anything right. They don't want to do anything except just please the flesh. And that's what they're doing. But yet, verse 5 says, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And from such, we should turn away. If we see somebody that's marching around saying that they're a Christian, and yet they don't believe that Jesus is God, and they're trying to force you to do certain things when the Bible says you're saved by grace through faith alone, then those are traitors. Those are heady, high-minded boasters. Those are liars. Those are deceivers. And what do they do? Verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with lusts, lust, excuse me, with sins, led away with diverse lusts. That's what religion is today. There are many religions, and what do they do? Religion wants to enslave. And so you see today many religions, and they want to enslave. What does that mean? They want to make you a slave, put you in bondage to them. But you see, Christ said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He said, if Christ will make you free, you shall be free indeed. So it's all about Jesus today. But yet many people claim to be Christians, and they're asleep, their eyes are closed, they're not awake, they don't see it. What does Paul say about these last days? Second, uh, excuse me, Peter say about these last days. Second Peter three three. Second Peter three three. We read. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. What is a scoffer? Well, scoffer is someone that goes around going, ha, 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 is that really true? Yeah, is that really God's word? Is Jesus really God? Did Jesus even exist? Is there really truth in the Bible? Ha, ha, ha. Well, we are seeing today, and like any time in history, a day and age in which there's more and more people that are making fun of God in the Bible. I gave my testimony of how I got into the ministry several weeks ago. You can watch that video. And I told about how when I went to a secular university co uh, college or secular university and how the first thing they do in those secular universities, I saw it. Other people I've talked to, they've seen it. First thing they do is attack God and the Bible. And yet Christians, people that claim to be Christians, take their beautiful, sweet, little, innocent sons and daughters and send them off to places like that. So they can be talked out of their faith in Jesus Christ talked out of their faith in God and the Bible, taught to believe, oh, there's no such thing as God in the Bible. Oh yeah, well, what is there? Uh, evolution, we're all animals. Well, what does that lead to? They start living like and acting like animals, walking in their own ungodly lusts, fornicating, adulterating, living in homosexual sin, doing things that aren't right. Are you awake? I don't understand how a person can claim to be a Christian and send their children to a college. Why don't you send them to a Christian college? Why would you send them to a secular college that preaches nothing but communism and homosexuality and evil and makes fun and scoffs at God in the Bible? Well, sadly, many Christians aren't awake. They don't see that. They just say, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with college. Why don't you go there? I swear, as soon as you show up, they attack God in the Bible. That's what they exist for. That's what they want to do. They want you to be immoral and evil, and they can't wait to damn you to hell and indoctrinate you with anti-biblical teachings. We'll look at that a little bit more in a minute. So we're living in the last days. And look what it says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You see, we live in a day and age in which devils, demons, are running rampant, and they've set themselves up in the secular schools around the world. 
And they can't wait to get your children so they can lie and teach them doctrines of devils and lie to them and deceive them and teach them how to sin in ways they never could have thought of themselves. Are you awake? Have you woken up to that? Have you gone, wow, I shouldn't send my son and daughter to a secular school. Where's a good Bible school? Or why not just let them stay home and learn themselves? Why not teach them how to start a business? Why follow the way the world does things when the world's getting worse and worse and all the world cares to do is scoff at God and the Bible? Well, I have a sermon on YouTube entitled, Are We in the Last Days? I go into that more there if you'd like to look that up. My sermon, Are We in the Last Days? Are we in the last days? Well, have you woken up to this? Have you woken up to the fact that America has been taken over by communists, atheists, godless people? Have you woken up to that? Have you, have you realized that America is not what America used to be? I know people that say, well, you know, America is still America. She's the land of the free, home of the brave. No, no. She's not the land of the free, home of the brave. She's the land of lawlessness, corruption, and evil, and people who hate God that are led by seducing spirits trying to lie and deceive with their doctrines of devils. One of which is that Jesus Christ is not God. Another of which is, oh, well, if you just keep the law, you'll go to heaven. Another of which is, oh, we're not in the lost days. There's plenty of time left. Do what you want. Live, live the way you want. Have a, have a nice life because there's plenty of time left. I'm sure that's what they said in the days of Noah when he was building the ark. Oh, Noah's just a nut. You know, that guy keeps talking about God. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Just forget it. And then the rains came down and they drowned. And they were with sheer terror screaming out, Oh, God! I'm sorry! But God proved he was true. Well, in these days we see that God is proving that he's true through the scriptures. But yet there's more and more people that are scoffers. There's more and more evil taking place. The Bible says in the last days, the love of many shall wax cold. We're seeing less and less love in the world today. And all it's doing is proving the Bible's true. But yet people are asleep. So what they don't understand is that we live in a country, the United States of America, that has been taken over. All of Europe has been taken over. Other parts of the world have been taken over by communism, by socialism, by evil teachings, by evolution, doctrines of devils that aren't true. And many people are not allowed to even open a Bible and read it in many countries in the world today. They burn Bibles. ISIS is taking over many countries in the Middle East and beheading Christians and not allowing them to read the Bible while they rape and steal and plunder. But no, you know, I'm still asleep. Everything's great. I live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I, life is so wonderful. Is it really wonderful? Is it really as wonderful as you think it is? Have you ever looked at some of the people that are supposedly elected and in power in the United States of America? Communists, socialists, witches. They literally belong to covens. They're witches. Uh, they stand up and say, well, we're going to pass this law so we know what's in it because, you know, we've never read it. So we have to pass the law to uh, understand what's in the law. That's corruption. That's evil. That's wickedness. Now let's look briefly, quickly, at the history of the United States of America and look at some of the things that, that America has done as a nation. One of the biggest things that happened was the Civil War. Don't have time to go into that today. But the uncivil war would be a better word for it. Because the South was right. And they seceded according to the Constitution. They didn't want to be taxed 40-some percent of their income for the moral tariff. So they said, we're done. We're gone. We're out of here. Well, the North attacked. And the North conquered the South and took over. And now let's look at the history of the United States of America. Is everything they've done been righteous and true and just according to the Bible? Or could it be that everything that it's been doing since then is against God and the Bible? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 1. There's a lot of people today that say the Civil War was all about slavery, all about slavery, all about slavery. Well, no, not really. That became a side issue. And after history was rewritten, that became why they justified their attacking and conquering a foreign nation, the North overtaking the South. But if you go to the Bible, what does the Bible say about slavery? Everybody today says slavery is evil, slavery is evil, slavery is evil. Okay, if slavery is evil, then what are you doing about it? Well, we're just writing books about how bad the South was to own slaves. 
Really? Well, what about you go over to the Muslim nations where they still practice slavery? Where are the abolitionists of today talking against that? For some reason, they don't ever want to talk about that. But when you look at the true facts of history, only 5% of the South owned slaves. Something like 20 or 30% of northern people owned slaves. You ever looked at history? Have you ever awoken and looked at the facts? Rather than opening your mind and letting these wicked, evil people fill your mind with lies? The Bible tells us they're seducing spirits with doctrines of devils. Should we believe everything we hear or should we study it ourselves? What does the Bible say about slavery? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look what it says here in verse 1 through 5. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. What? what? It's talking about slavery. And it says if you're a saved slave, you should count your owner worthy and not blaspheme God by being against your slave owner. Because this blasphemes God and his doctrine. What does that mean? Well, I know what it means. It means God, in the Bible, allowed slavery. <gasps> oh, no! Oh, no! Yeah, it's not, not good. I don't like slavery. I wouldn't want to be a slave. But there was an allowance for it in the Bible. Continue. Let's continue reading. Context clearly is slavery. Verse 2. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather, rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. So the Bible teaches you're to teach and exhort that if you're a servant... Then to look up to your master, if you're both Christians. And if you're a master, to look up to your servant, because you're both Christians. It does not say anywhere in the Bible, get rid of and abolish slavery. <laughs> you know what that means? That means the anti-slavery movement is an anti-Bible teaching. And it's going against the doctrine, verse 1, of God. Look at what it says here in verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Verse 5. Still talking about slavery and the people against it. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Well, there's the Civil War in a nutshell. The South said, we're withdrawing ourselves from the North because they're trying to go against God in the Bible. I don't have time to go into that, but there were many Catholics, Universalists, Unitarians in the North. In the South, there were many Bible-believing Methodists, Baptists, Episcopalians that believed this gospel. And they said, we don't like the doctrines from the north being preached and shoved upon us, especially telling us we have to pay a moral tariff of 48%. And so the South said, we're gone. We withdraw ourselves. Isn't that something that in the Bible God allowed and gave allowance to slavery? And yet you have a whole nation that says, well, we freed the slaves. And everyone says, isn't that good? Was it good or was it going against the Bible? Now, I hate slavery probably more than anybody else. But do you know if you study the history of the world, you know who were slaves more than anyone in the history of the world? White people. Yet today, there are divisive, mean, hateful, angry individuals that want to go around and spew lies from their mouth and say, oh, white people are evil for owning slaves. Oh, really? How many slaves were owned by black slaves were owned? Or how many white people owned black slaves in the South? Only 5%. So very few. That means 95% of the South was righteous, God-fearing, God-loving people that said, I'm not going to own a slave. And many of that 5% of the South were people that had homes up north where they'd go up in the winter or in the summer and spend the summer up north and come down in the South. So what is this slavery all about? Well, you look at Rome. You look at Greece. They would put people as slaves that were white people. And those last for hundreds and thousands of years. Well, you look at slavery in America, the blacks were slaves for 200 years or so, maybe 250. But you look at the, the Jews, the Jews were slaves for 400 years in Egypt. That means the black people, the Egyptians, owned slaves for 400 years. And yet today, all you're told is all white people are evil because they own slaves. How about Muslims are evil because they still practice slavery? How about all people are evil because they own slaves, if slavery is evil? 
And how about, why attack the South when only 5% of the people in the South own slaves and something like 20 or 30% up North? Well, if you really want to blame somebody, place the blame where it belongs. Why don't we blame the blacks for putting the Jews as slaves years ago, for 400 years? Today they say, well, we need reparations. Pay the black people reparations. Okay, as soon as you pay, pay the Jews for your four, their 400 years of slavery to you black people, then we'll think about maybe talking about reparations, whites for blacks. You see, all it is is division. All it is is to go against God and the Bible. When God says people that want to run around and talk about slavery, they are proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of word whereof coming envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. God says they're perverse people, destitute, corrupt, destitute of the truth, supposing God is godly. So you want to talk about slavery? Was it right for the North to free the slaves? Well, first of all, they didn't free any slaves. Because the, the uh, proclamation or whatever, the Emancipation Proclamation, that didn't free anybody. It was a different country telling this country, the South, oh, we free you slaves. Number two, it never freed any slaves in the North. Matter of fact, President Grant had slaves in the White House in the 1880s, 70s and 80s. So you really want to go there? Well, let's go there. When did they have slaves? Who was the first slave in the United States of America? Have you ever looked into history on that? You go back, in, the, in England they had what was called an, uh, uh, an, an indentured servant. And England had a small population and there were criminals all the time because the evil king would rob from the people so the people had to do something to live. A lot of times they'd go to crime just to feed themselves. And so many people were being hung, white people that is, that in England they decided, you know what, we've got these people over in Virginia now that have big plantations. Why don't we um, give criminals the option to be hung or to work as an indentured servant in Virginia? You read Moll Flanders if you want to. I don't recommend it, that's a pretty evil book. But it talks about how she was sold as an indentured servant. And so before there was black slavery in America, there was indentured servitude where white people that were criminals were sent to Virginia, and usually the contract was seven years you worked as an indentured servant. And at the end of your servitude, you were given freedom, and oftentimes a piece of land to start your own life in the new world. That was what slavery came from, indentured servitude. Well then, in the United States of America, there was a black man who said, I have a right to own another black man. And you know what he did? He went to court. And the English court allowed a black man to own another black man. The first case of a black man uh, of slavery, of, for life, of a black man, not just seven years, for life, was a black man owning a black man in the United States of America. And yet, they want to run around and try to guilt white people into having black slaves. When 95% of the people that live in the South never had a slave. Why? Why do you allow people to lie to you and try to make you feel bad and get what they call white guilt? Why do you allow them to, to go about and, and dote questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, and railings? So this whole thing about slavery is an anti-biblical thing. Let's look at another one. United States of America in the late 1800s started what they called the women's suffrage movement. And women started going around saying, we deserve our rights, we deserve our rights. Okay, sure. I mean, there's some rights that women have, especially if their husband dies, they should have a right to own property, unlike Islam, in which they don't have that right. You know, people attack America, say America's so, so horrible. There's a lot more freedom for a woman in America than there are in those countries. Yeah, and, and, and you don't ever preach against them having slaves, do you? But in America, no, it's the thing to scoff and attack the Bible, so let's do it. And that's what they do. But what does the Bible tell us about women? What is the woman's role according to the Scriptures? Well, if you believe the Bible, the Bible says a woman's supposed to uh, love her husband get married and obey her husband. 1 Peter 3, 1 says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, feminists hate this. Why? Because feminists are led by evil, demonic spirits that are going against God and the Bible. 
And feminists say, never get married, girl. Start your own job and, and get your career and live your own life and do whatever you do. You don't have to listen to anybody. But God says, no, I would the younger woman marry, bear children, guide the house. That's God's place for a woman according to the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 5, we read in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Wherefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So, in the scriptures, God says the man is the head of the home, and the wife obeys her husband. But today they scoff at that, and laugh at that, and mock, and say, oh, that's horrible. Yet, even nature teaches that's how it's worked for thousands of years. So, you're going against not only the Bible, you're going against nature itself. The men were the hunter-gatherers. The men were the stronger ones. The men were the protectors. The women were the child-bearers. They would stay home. They would cook. They would take care of the young. That's the way that it's set up. And yet today, no, we want to go against God in the Bible. So are you starting to see that everything it seems like America is doing and the world is doing? It's like they looked at the Bible and said, hmm, what does it say and how can we go exactly 100% against what the Bible teaches? And that's what they're doing. Today we have animal rights. What does the Bible say about that? You know, you can go to jail if you do something to an animal that they don't approve of. Well, I don't approve of doing bad things to an animal. I believe being nice to animals. But there, today, if you do something to an animal that they don't approve of, well, you can get put in jail. What does the Bible say about that? Do animals really have rights? Well, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It doesn't get much plainer than that. Man has dominion. Over what? Well, he says it again in verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That means we have dominion over them. That means they don't have rights. That means we're the head over them. But now, no animal rights that put people in jail for certain things. How about trees' rights, you know? Oh, rights have trees. All these tree huggers run around. No, the trees have rights. No, they don't. They're inanimate objects. It's sure they can grow, but they don't have souls. Who are they? So you have all these different laws being passed, and it seems like they all look at the Bible and what the Bible says and says, hmm, I don't like that. I'm going to go the exact opposite way. <laughs> Why is that? What about homosexuals? We live in a day and age today in which, uh, was it last year or the beginning of this year, that the Supreme Court said, well, it's okay for homosexuals to get married. What does the Bible say? Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 22, God says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Genesis 13, 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and cedars exceedingly before the Lord. The Bible teaches us that homosexuality is not just a sin. It's exceedingly wicked and an outright abomination in the eyes of God. So what did the Supreme Court do? What did the government do? They said, oh, look what the Bible says. Well, rip that out. Uh, let's cross out what the Bible says and do what the seducing spirits tell us to do. Yeah! That'd be wonderful. And so let's allow gay marriage. And otherwise, and in other words, let's stamp with our approval sin and tell people let's do it and do it all you want to because we're going to God as we do it makes you sick. It's almost like Satan's in control of this whole thing. And he's working behind the scenes to go against God and the Bible. What about transgenders? Well, wait a minute. Let me go back to the homosexuals. I forgot to read Romans chapter 1. If homosexuality was just love, like they say, then there's no problem, right? Why is it that God is so against homosexuality? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 27, And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and recompensing in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Now look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Homosexuality is a sin. People that do homosexual acts are reprobates. 
What does it mean to be reprobate? It means you cannot control yourself. You are a threat to yourself and others because you can't say no. And that sin leads to the sin of pedophilia. And we're living in a day and age in which today they're trying to say, you know, we should pass laws to allow pedophilia. Mm -hmm. Even though the Bible tells you not to do that. So the Bible tells us not to commit homosexual acts because those that become homosexuals, they do not retain God in their mind. Everything they do, they do and they say, I hate you, God, and I don't want to think of you because what you do is condemn me and my act. No, what you're doing is condemning God and His acts in the Bible and what God says to do. So it's like everything that we're seeing the world do today, and especially in America, it's like they're saying, well, what does the Bible say so that we can do the exact opposite? <laughs> That's the world we live in today. What about this? I just read today. They want to draft women into the army. Can you imagine that? If you get a chance, go back to YouTube and look up uh, a video that I did called The Communist Takeover of America. And I hope, if nothing else, that will wake you up. Because whether you know it or not, we live in America with a K. We live in a communist nation. We don't live in a, a nation that, that believes in the Constitution and freedom. Communism and communistic doctrines have taken over the United States of America. You say, I don't believe it. Watch that video. I give you all the tenets of the Communist Manifesto, and I show you how America has adopted almost every single one of them. And one of the things that communism does, even though God says men and women are different, very different, is to say there's no genders, there's no sexes, they're all the same. They're all under communism. They all have the same duties and same responsibilities. And their children aren't their children, they belong to the state. So the state uses them to have children for the state. Isn't that evil? What does the Bible say about women being drafted in the army? Deuteronomy 24, 5 says, When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. So the Bible says, you know, if a man has to go to war, because war, men fight, not women, he has to stay home for a year, then he can go out. It's like the government said, well, look at the, what does the Bible say? Oh, no, men, men fight in wars. No, let's say women fight in wars. Let's take everything the Bible says and preach the exact opposite and pass laws against God in the Bible. Where does it end? Now there's the transgender issue. We have the right to pretend we're transgender. Really? Really? What, what, what does the Bible say about that? Well, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to bet that it's the exact opposite of what you're saying. And, matter of fact, that's what it is. You see, transgender says, I have a right to choose what I am if I'm a man or a woman. Well, is that what the Bible teaches? Does the Bible tell us that God made you and then said, now you decide what you are? No. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Go to Matthew chapter 19 and look at what Jesus said. In Matthew 19, uh, verse 4, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that which which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So God says He made them male and female. You're born in the world, you're either a man or a woman, a male or a female. You don't get to choose. God chose for you. Now what are you going to do? Well, most people, because they want to follow this rather than the Bible, say, well, they're allowing me to do whatever I want. So I, I choose to identify as a man, and you're born a woman, or vice versa. Now, there's people that are taking that to an opposite extreme. Well, I choose to identify as a German shepherd. And people are becoming completely insane. They're reprobates. They're insane. Years ago, an old preacher said, America is an insane asylum run by the inmates. You know, for years I couldn't understand what he's saying. Now I do. Now they're trying to tell you where you can go to the bathroom. Now they're trying to tell you, you you can go to a woman's bathroom if you're a man or vice versa. If you just think you're a woman. Another day I got a phone call and it was some, some computer. You ever get those calls where a computer is on the phone? There's one way to tell. Whenever people call me and they're selling something, I always say, are you a computer? And when I say that, I hear click and it takes a second for them to respond. And then I start talking real fast in the hopes that they'll listen to me and respond. But a computer can't think that fast, so they don't respond. So I was talking on the phone, and this guy called up, and I said, Are you a computer? And he says, Click. I, I am not. I am a real human being. I just have a computer to help me with my voice, it said. I said, You are kidding me. 
You tell me you're a human being, but you have a computer to help you with your voice. Are you a computer? I said, I think you're a computer. I said, I want to talk to your manager. And I said, I want you to take me off of your call list. And when I said that, it went beep in the background. You have been taken off of our call list. And yet this computer voice kept saying, we would like to talk to you about, I said, are you a human? And it stopped and paused. Of course, I'm a real human being person. <laughs> I mean, words that no human being would say, they don't make sense. And so I just said, goodbye, Mr. Computer, and hung up. I don't like talking to computers on the phone. But I told my wife, as crazy as this world is today, you know what I can do now? After that phone call, I realized that that was a man that chose to be transcomputered. Yep. He chose that he wanted to identify as a computer. So from now on, I am no longer Robert Breaker, the, the human being, living soul person. I am a transcomputer. And from now on, I will talk as the voice of a computer. I want you to recognize me transcomputerly as a transputer person. See how ridiculous that is? But that's no more ridiculous than the world trying to say, I'm a man, and she's a woman. Or, I'm a woman, and she's a man. And try to change the sexes that God gave you. It's all about going against God in the Bible. America has been taken over by people that hate God. And rather than using this book as the basis, you know, America was founded and they took the Old Testament law in many places for the laws of the land. But rather than God in the Bible, it's let's turn as far from God in the Bible as we can. Are you awake to that? Have you, have you seen that yet? There are many Christians that don't even see that. They just say, hmm, interesting. They don't see that it's not just the way the world's going. It's seducing demonic spirits, spitting in the face of God and controlling things behind the scenes to kick out God and the Bible. That's the world we live in. Satanists are in charge. How about this one? Have you, opened, have you woken up to the fact that economic collapse is coming? Have you figured that out yet? You know, there's a lot of people in this world that don't understand that behind the scenes they've been working and they have a goal. Their goal is to exterminate as many human beings as they can. And one way to do that is by economic collapse. Well, what is true riches according to the Bible? Many people think you pull out a dollar bill, that's, that's money. That's not money. Look right on it. It says Federal Reserve Note. That is a bank note. And you know what it is? It's a note of bankruptcy. It's an IOU. And what's backed by is debt. So it's a bankruptcy note. It mean, it's nothing but a piece of paper you can use when you go to the toilet, basically. That's what it means. There's nothing backing that piece of paper. So what is real money? Well, Genesis 13.2 says, And Abraham was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. The first person in the Bible that God says was rich was Abraham. And it says what riches are. They're cattle, silver, and gold. You can add to that land and crops. True riches is owning things in which you're self-reliant and you can pay your own bills, you can do your own thing, you can live, and you don't have to rely upon anyone else. That's true riches. And that's how the economy was based in America for many years. They had silver and gold coins. 1933, old Roosevelt said, nope, now on, no more gold coins. And all the gold was taken in by the government. And they went off the gold standard. Eventually, they went off the silver standard. You can still find old dollars, and they say silver certificate, pay her to in demand, the bearer in silver. What's it backed by today? What's the economy backed by today? Rather than gold and silver, which is real money according to the Bible, the economy is backed by oil. Do you know what oil is? Oil is this black, dirty, slick thing. I want you to think about that because the economy shows the degradation of man. Gold and silver are what made money. Why? Because up in heaven, what's it lined with? Gold. Silver up there. So gold is a type of heaven. And God wants people to have a little piece of heaven in their hands and go use it for money every day and pay. But they took away gold and silver backing the dollar, and then old Nixon was behind this. They backed the dollar with oil. What is oil? It's the blackest, dirtiest, slickest, nastiest thing you've ever seen. 
that, that stains. Where does it come from? From the earth. So man, rather than having something that truly is rich, makes you riches that reminds us of God and God above in heaven, said, you know what we want to do? We want to replace our money with gold and silver with the deepest, blackest, nastiest thing down, found under the ground, under where hell is. And we want to pull that out. And we want to back our money with that. Does that show you the wicked, evil heart of man? Rather than wanting something from above, they want to go to the deepest, darkest, nastiest, dirtiest thing they can find and then exalt that to back our money with. Well, there's the cash versus the accrual method of an economy. The cash method means you don't get it until you pay for it. Well, the accrual method is, well, you know, I sign a piece of paper and you give it to me and, and I tell everybody it's mine, but it's really not until I pay for it. You know, that's called credit. In the Bible, there's no such thing as credit. Credit is a bad thing. And you're supposed to uh, get out of debt every so many years. And God forgives debts. But debt is something you're never supposed to get in. Why? Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 7. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich, let's see, am I right? 22, 7. Ruleth over the poor. Yep, Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Servant. Servant. Well, well that's a slave. So that takes us back over here. So what the devil does is he says, let's get rid of the gold and silver because that reminds me of heaven. And I fell out of heaven a long time ago and it just makes me mad when I see that. He says, I like dark, dirty, nasty stuff. He said, I'm going to turn the whole world economy to the blackest, dirtiest thing that there is that comes out of the bowels of the earth that catches on fire like hell because that's where the devil's going. He says, I want you to have that to back your money. And then the devil says, and I want you to be my slave. So from now on, I'm going to make money, not a little piece of paper. It's going to be a little plastic credit card. You know what plastic is? All plastic products are made out of this black oil. Did you know that? Did you know plastic comes from black, dirty oil? And so you have a little credit card. And you go around and you, you put everything on credit. Most people in America are so far in debt, they can never get out. What does that mean? That means they are going to be enslaved to their lenders. Credit card companies, 28%, many of them, charge for people that are in debt. Well, Jesus said, owe a debt to no man. You're supposed to live out of debt within all your means. But what does the devil do? He twists, he challenges everything to make it as horrible and evil as possible to get every man in debt to him. Have you ever thought about that? In the 60s, they produced what they called Mutually Assured Destruction. And in the 60s, they set up also the Mutually Assured Economic Destruction. And they set up all the economies around the world so that if one fell, they all fell. And the incentive was so that they wouldn't be corrupt, they'd all want a good economy, so they allowed all economies to be good. And that was great. It worked great for a while. Great idea. Except what do you do when the devil takes over? And the devil's used to take it over by order out of chaos. How's the best way to get chaos? Why? Destroy all the economies of the world, and then the world is all yours. Well, that's what the devil is working to do. And all over Europe, we're seeing the destructions of economies. Spain, Greece. Something, somebody said the other day, you can, it's not allowed in Greece to get out more than $67, something like that, a week. They've destroyed the economies on purpose. What is the goal? The goal is the new world order. The goal is to bring in the mark of the beast. The goal is to get everyone on a credit system so that they're no longer free. They're, in, they're, they're servants to the lender. The next one here I want to say is, are you awake to the fact that world government is here? You see, a lot of people never heard this before. That's why I'll keep saying it till my dying day. Because people need to wake up. It's not all peaches and roses. Not everything is great in this world. There is a plan that has been set up to destroy this world on purpose and to kill as many people as possible. And then when the devil takes over, he'll start his kingdom in the tribulation in which he'll start giving people the mark of the beast. Did you know that this pope came out and recently said that he calls for a new world government? Many people are behind what they call the new world order. Many people today are working for the new world order. Did you ever see that? video by Rene Russo 
where he was telling about how he became friends with the Rockefeller, and the Rockefeller says, well, our plan is to make everybody poor and then turn everyone into, like, cattle to where they're chipped, and they all they have no money except the chip. What does that sound like? That sounds like exactly what the Bible says is the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 11 through 18 talks about the mark of the beast. There exists today an RFID chip. And they're already taking this little chip and injecting it. It's about the size of a grain of rice. It has over on this side a whole lot of copper. And when you move, it energizes that chip. And that little chip, they want to chip in people. Have you woken up to that? Do you see that? Are you awake? Do you see how close we are to the end? Because people are already getting chips. Some here, some right here is where they inject it. Do you know what the Illuminati is? Have you studied it? Adam Weishaupt in the 1700s started the Illuminati. It was a secret society with one goal in mind, to bring out a one world government in which one person or a group of people run the entire world. And guess what they were? They were Satanists. They were globalists. They were Illuminatiists. They were worshippers of Lucifer. George Washington spoke against the Illuminati in his day. Did you know that? Did you? No. Oh. I'm sorry, you were asleep, weren't you? Wake up! Study! Look! Find out for yourself the truth! It's all headed in one direction! And that one direction is the rapture and is Satan's kingdom. Which one will you be in? They already have electro electronic currency. It's here. Bitcoin. They now call blockchain. They have it all set up where it would be very easy for them to make everyone in the world take a little chip. And then through electronic devices, you buy and sell just as the Bible teaches. If you want to learn more about that, see my videos on YouTube, What the Bible Says About the New World Order. I also have one entitled, What the Bible Says About Globalization and Why It's Happening. It's all Satanist, working for Satan to bring about a one world satanic order under Satan. It's right there in your face. If you're just awake, you'd see it. Are you awake? You know, I start talking like this and people who claim to be Christians go, Oh, you're just so crazy. The Lord's not coming back for another 20, 30 years. Uh, it could be today. Have you thought about that? Are you awake? Last thing I want to say. Are you awake to the fact that Jesus is coming soon? A lot of people I've met claim to be Christians have no sense of urgency that Jesus is coming soon. My dad used to always say, have a sense of urgency. Live every day like Jesus was coming. Try to reach as many people as you can with the gospel. Try to tell others about Jesus Christ. Do everything you can to please God. Lay up treasures in heaven because time is short and Jesus is coming soon. Oh, no, no, no. There's, there's a long time to go. Is there? Is there really? Let's look at Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 22. Look at what it says. One of the second to last verses in the whole Bible. Revelation 22, 20. He, said, he which testifies, testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So Jesus said, I come quickly. Well, you look at the, the Bible. What does it teach? Well, Jesus came. He was born in what? 33? Um, well, he died at 33, so he was born in 0 A.D. Well, the Bible tells us in Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Jesus says, after two days, and in the third day, I will come back and raise you up again. I don't have time to go into this, the 7,000 years of human history. But if you get a chance, go to YouTube, check out my video, the 7,000 years of human history. The Bible teaches that there's only 7,000 years, all total. And everything that's happened in history up to today corresponds exactly with the 7,000 years. Jesus shows up here, 4,000 years exactly from Adam. All right, so here we are in the church age, and we're about 2,000 years later. Well, 2 Peter 3.8 says, A day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. So when Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, here we are 2,000 years later, and the scoffers say, Ha, 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 that's not very quick. It's been 2,000 years. That old book's a lie. But in God's eyes, if with the Lord a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day, in God's eyes, it's about two days. <laughs> if a thousand years is as one day, and vice versa. So that sounds pretty quick to me. When Jesus comes at the rapture to take his bride, he's only really waiting about two days. I mean, what, who can't wait two days? What if you were going to get married tomorrow? And I said, well, wait two more days. You'd say, well, okay. 
You'd say, well, I'm coming quickly. In two days, we're going to get married. What if I said, well, in 2,000 years, I'll be back and we'll get married. Oh, that's too long. Well, in God's calendar, 2,000 years to Him is like two days. So sure, He's coming quickly. So 2,000 years are almost over. And there's a lot of theories about when the rapture will be. I don't have time to go into that. Some people say because Jesus died in 33 A.D., well then, the rapture is going to have to be in 2033. There's other people that say, yeah, but what about 1948? Jesus, when he's speaking here on the earth, he says, you know, uh, 70 years are determined upon your people. He says a generation. Well, a generation is 70 years. And you go, to, you go to Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. Matter of fact, let's read that. That's an interesting verse. What if the rapture were 70 years after the forming of the nation of Israel? Well, some people theorize, let's go to Isaiah, excuse me, Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. I believe that's right. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, that's seventy. And if by reason of strength there be fourscore years, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow. Now watch this. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. <laughs> what a funny thing to say, and we fly away. Well, Jesus is talking, and 70 years, Israel started a generation 70 years. So from 1948, 70 years will put you out here about 2018. Will the rapture be in 2018? I'm not, I don't know. It says, up by strength, 80 years. So what would that be, 2028? You know, we're getting close. Can't be any later than 2033. If it says in Hosea 6, 1 and 2 that God speaking to Israel says, I'll come back to you after two days. 2,000 years. It's been almost 2,000 years of the church age. A lot of people out there try to set the date of when Jesus is coming. Is it wrong to set a date? Well, Matthew 24, 36 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man but my Father only. Matthew 25, 13, Ye know neither the day nor the hour that the Son of Man cometh. Mark 13, 32, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. When Jesus said all those things, He said them while He was here in His earthly kingdom. And the reason He said no man knows the day or the hour is because this is a transitional book, the book of Acts. And those Jews could have accepted their Messiah then, and this church age would have been really short. But because the Jews rejected their Messiah then, so I believe it's possible to know around, close to, Maybe not the exact day, but we can know pretty close. Do you know when Jesus was born, there was a star that appeared in heaven? And the Bible tells us that within two years, these wise men knew, and they found Jesus, based upon a star that marked the sign of Jesus coming. You ever read the news? Have you noticed that there's a star in heaven today? And the scientists said, oh, this was the exact same star that appeared when Jesus was born. That star is appearing again. I've seen it. It's pretty cool. It's two stars really close together. So it looks like one, but you've got to really look, and you can see two distinct tiny little stars. Isn't that just coincidence that it happened to appear? Some people say the rapture should have been in 2015. We say, oh, we scoff, we laugh, you know. I made a September 24th video, showed all the things that happened to September 24th. Not one of them was the rapture. I never said that the rapture would take place. Well, some people say, well, there's the acceptable day of the Lord, so 2016 is going to be the rapture. I have a book over there where a guy says mathematically, he used math, I hate math, to prove that the rapture's got to be this year. And so the reason it didn't come in 2015 is this is the acceptable year of the Lord. So September 2016, they say, is the rapture. I don't know. I'm not trying to set the date, but I want to read you something. First Thessalonians chapter 5. You see, a lot of Christians aren't awake to the fact that we are that close to the rapture. I mean, we are very, very close to the rapture. Yet some Christians live their life like, Oh, uh, he's not coming for another 20, 30 years. Really? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 1 through 4. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. A woman and child? No woman and child. Well, how long is a woman pregnant for? Forty weeks. Is it possible that we can know within forty weeks of when the rapture is? Maybe not the day or the hour? Well, look what he says in verse 4. 
But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Huh? I mean, it almost sounds like he's saying, look, you, you're not in darkness. That day's coming. And you know, you know when it's coming. That day. I'm not saying that you can know the day. I, I heard a theory not too long ago on YouTube of a preacher. He was preaching and he uh, looked into all the feasts of Israel. And he said, did you know that one of the feasts of Israel is it's called the feast that no man knoweth the day or the hour? I thought that was interesting. Because all the Jewish feasts appear upon the new moons. So the Jewish calendar is the lunar calendar, and every time they have a feast, it's all based upon a moon. But there's one feast out of the year, every year, in which it can go either way. It could fall on this day or the other day, because the way the moon's set up. And so they call that the feast that no man knows the day or the hour, because it's always iffy. Not until the actual day or a day or two before can you even know what actual day that feast will fall on. Oh, that's pretty weird. And so they preach, well, Jesus is saying when no man knoweth the day or the hour, he's saying it'll be on that feast where no man can know the day or the hour. So one of those days will be the rapture. I don't know. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it is. But I'm asking, are you aware of the fact that we are in the last days, that Jesus is coming soon, that an economic collapse is coming? And by the way, it's almost here. Have you prepared for that? Do you realize America has been taken over by communists? And we're about to have an election, and communists don't allow elections when they take over. There's never been in the history of the world a communist that took over and says, well, I gave it a good old college try, but they don't want it, so I'll allow free elections. It's never happened. And yet we have in the White House a self-avowed communist, Muslim, socialist, who has taken over. Do you think commies step down? I hope to God they do. But I've never seen it in the history of the world. You know, the old saying is the only thing that men ever learn from history is that men never learn from history. There are FEMA camps. There are coffins already bought. There's coming economic and global disasters. And it's all been prepared, prepared for by the global government. And they're going to take advantage of that and bring in the Antichrist kingdom. There are many videos on YouTube about it. Are you awake? Have you woken up to that fact? What are you doing about it? A lot of people say, well, because the economic collapse, buy food. Yes, do that. Buy lots of food. You might need it. But have you prepared spiritually? Are you spiritually awake to the truth? The Bible says that in the last days there will be a falling away from the truth. Well, we are in these last days of apostasy and the falling away. There are many people falling away from the truth. There are many people that don't have the right gospel of salvation. There are many people that don't believe Jesus is God. Many people don't realize we're in the last days where there will be demons running all over the earth teaching their false doctrines, deceiving and lying to people. We are in those last days. Are you awake? Do you see that? If you are saved, are you trying to reach others? Wouldn't it be horrible to leave behind your father, your mother, your sister, your grandma, and the rapture come and you say, Oh man, I wasn't awake. I didn't expect it. I was going to witness to them. Oh man. And they die and go to hell because you were asleep spiritually. Let's close with Romans chapter 13, verse 11. Romans 13, 11 through 14. And that knowing the time, do you know the time? Do you see the times we live in? We are very close. We are in the last days. We're close to the coming of the rapture. Do you see that? Are you awake to that fact? It says, in that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is the salvation nearer than we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He says, Awake out of your sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Are you saved? If you're not saved, why don't you come to Jesus Christ, trust Him as your Savior, trust the Gospel through faith alone. If you are saved, you need to prepare for the uh, uh, collapse. You know, people tell me, well, yeah, just like uh, the year 2000, Y2K, you know, people said, get water, get food, get all this stuff, and nothing happened. I know it didn't. But why is it wrong to prepare? You see, if the rapture is coming, you might just be preparing for these people and helping them so they don't have to take the mark of the beast. You know, buy as much food as you can get. Stock up on it. And then put it in your house. 
Because it just might be that these people in the tribulation don't want to take the mark of the beast, but they can't buy and sell, but then they stumble in your house and say, well, look at this, 20 years worth of food. I can get through the tribulation. I'll just hide out here. I'm just saying, it wouldn't hurt. Do you have the money and the ability to do it? It never hurts to buy food that lasts for 20 years. You can always eat it later. But things are getting bad. Things are going from bad to worse. And very shortly there's going to be some horrible disaster in the world. There will be martial law everywhere. They'll be cracking down. And they will force people to take this mark. That's why I believe this rapture has got to take place first. Are you ready? Are you saved? Do you have a sense of urgency? Do you believe what I'm saying today? Are you all... Mm, I'm sorry, what, what did you say? Asleep. If you are awake, and I hope you are, the first thing you need to realize is more than anything, the most important thing is winning people to Jesus Christ. So take the gospel with you if you're a servant of God, if you're saved. Get people saved, because that's one less person that the Antichrist will get to give a mark to. That's one less person he'll force into slavery because they'll go at the rapture and the devil won't get them. So thank you for watching this. I probably could have said a lot more things, but are you awake? It's a good message. It's a good question. If you're not, wake up! <laughs> it's time to wake up. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Let's get some other folks saved and take them with us to heaven. God bless you. We'll see you next time on the Cloud Church.